General McChrystal has announced to avoid civilian casualties caused by airstrikes. What specific kind of restrictions have been imposed by ISAF to prevent collateral damage by close air support? In which case would close air support be possible? Close air support is possible in most cases. I mean, one thing that General McChrystal has said, uh, even in, in the, the unclassified version of his tactical directive, is you know, he cannot prescribe you know, when and where close air support or indirect fire or small arms fire can be used you know, on a very complex battlefield by, uh, by soldiers that are in contact with the enemy. And, he, and he's not going to try to do that. What he has told everybody is, you know, we, 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 we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be able to kill our way to win this war. I don't think, I think if you look in the history of warfare, I think that's true everywhere. I mean, you really can't, we didn't, you know, whatever war we, we, we were in, I mean, we didn't kill all the enemy in order, to, in order to win the war. But here it's more critical, it's a counterinsurgency fight and there are civilians on the battlefield. And if we kill civilians, uh, it's in the long run, we're not gonna be able to, to, to reach our goals of, of getting these civilians to, to support the government, to truly have, have competent to, to, to believe in the government and, and believe in their competence and their credibility. So what we, we wanna avoid, I think we went through a period where, where we knew there was a lot of bad guys on there, and we, and, and we tried to kill them. And I don't think anybody accepted collateral damage, but you know, perhaps we weren't as careful as we could have been, and, and we did cause some collateral damage. But collateral damage was people. So a casualty is a casualty, whether it's an Afghan civilian, an Afghan soldier, an Afghan police, a uh, British soldier, an American soldier. To take the risk to kill four or five insurgents in a compound when there's a risk of killing civilians, it's just not worth it. You know, so we can wait them out, we can withdraw, we can get them up, we can get them a later day. But perhaps by showing restraint, the people will realize, well, you know what? They are here to help us. They are here to protect us. So those insurgents, they could have been just local insurgents and 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 they could have been out there planting IEDs. But now the people say, well, wait a minute, there's we can trust the government. They do have credibility. So the next time those five guys, when they do leave that compound that they've taken over and they plant those IEDs, maybe someone's going to come up and say, hey, there's an IED over there. Or, hey, those bad guys you were after a couple days ago, they're over there. So, you know, that's what we hope to accomplish. But uh, never is, a, is there any, any indication whatsoever that, uh, uh, that the, the use of close air support is prohibited to, to protect uh, it in self-defense. Never. I, I see, I read every contact report. I do, and just about every contact report involves close air support or artillery support. Maybe it's not fired, but it's there uh, and uh, ready to be used at all times. So uh, we're more careful about it. We go through a more deliberate process. You know, do we do we risk a soldier's life? You know, go charge that machine gun bunker instead of dropping a bomb? Never. Uh, you know, the commander's on the ground is the ultimate authority on what's to be used there. But hopefully we have a more deliberate process that we're more careful about it. Is ISAF headquarters in Kabul always involved if there is a request for close air support? In which case is close air support possible without involving ISAF HQ? There is one instance where ISAF headquarters is involved, but uh, it, it has to do with, uh, it, it doesn't have to do with troops in contact. No, the, uh, the commander on the ground, and in some cases, the next higher commander is the authority to use close air support or, or artillery. It does not come all the way up here. That would be, uh, it goes back to what I said initially. You know, General McChrystal realized that this, you know, in a complex battlefield, he can't tell people exactly when to drop bombs and not drop bombs. You've got to trust the person on the ground, and you've got to have confidence that they're going to make the right decision, understanding the ramifications of what they're doing. They've, their number one priority of every commander on the ground is to protect their soldiers. So, If there is a request for close air support, what normally is the exact chain of command? Can you describe the decision-making process and how does ISAF headquarters deal with such a request? ISAF headquarters won't deal with a request. Again, it'll be the commander on the ground who'll be dealing through the, uh, if we're talking about close air support fixed wing, it'll be the commander on the ground talking through his, his joint controller. We'll talk to the aircraft. The commander on the ground says, here's what I got. Uh, we expect the, uh, the air mission commander up there, whoever's flying that bird, to say, okay, here's the rules. Are you, are you an imminent threat? And, uh, you know, they'll discuss it back and forth, and they'll decide if, uh, 
if munitions are warranted to be dropped. In some cases, it'll require the next higher commander's uh, authorization for it to be dropped. But uh, nobody is ever going to question a commander that said, I needed it, I needed it now, my men were in danger, it's going to get dropped. A major objective of ISAF is to protect the Afghan population. Does it mean ISAF troops have to be deployed in cities and villages close to the people? Does it mean that troops have to leave their camps to live with the population? In a lot of cases, I think it, it, it says that soldiers have to leave their camps to live with the population. And every situation is a little bit different. But you're not going to protect the people from your fobs. I mean, that's, that's true. Uh, so we're going to have to go out there and in a lot of cases live with the people or live, live with our, our partners, the, uh, the Afghan uh, security forces. Uh, because we can't do it from we can't do it from our, our fobs. I mean, the, the people know that. I mean, they know if we're stuck inside their fobs and we're not out there uh, on our foot patrols or out there walking through their streets that we're not providing them any protection. Or if we go inside our fobs once it gets dark, that's not providing any protection. So we've got to get out there and be with them. Uh, of course, the other factor is that you do have that force protection factor that we have to take care of our soldiers too. So there's a balancing act there. But we have to get out there amongst the people, living with the people in their villages. I don't think they want that. Look at your hometown. Do you, I mean, do you, do you really want someone, you know, uh, taking over the local YMCA and, and living in there in the, in the name of protecting you? Yeah, probably not. But, you know, we need to have the presence out there to, to be there, to show that we're going to be there for the people all the time.